Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. Dollars. Of course, we've been at all-time highs in various other currencies for quite some time now. Uh, what, have, what have you been seeing in the market this week? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty for sure, and it is certainly having its toll, taking its toll on a lot of sectors within the economy. And we got a nice glimpse early in the week, around Tuesday, as to where gold price wants to head. And probably while most of our listeners were sleeping, we watched the price of silver navigate for about four or five hours right over $26 an ounce while gold touched almost nineteen eighty an ounce. And in the spur of a heartbeat, uh, a half hour, an hour later, pulled back into what has been a nice buying range for people this week and certainly giving some perspective and opportunity. So this begs a question. You're going to have lots of people listening right now saying, is it too late? to get involved in this market. I have an opinion, but I'd love to hear what you would say to someone who said, oh, but the market's already gone up. I think it might be too late to get involved. Well, this would certainly come in, come in at a time when we should discuss what are the fundamentals of the market. But in a nutshell, for me, no. Um, I use a really simple equation to determine whether or not it's too late. And that is, what is the percentage of people in the marketplace that are exposed to gold or silver. And right now, the world percentage is roughly just under 2%. And so if we look back historically over 100 years, the last four bull markets prior to this one, uh, the participation rate in exposure to gold or silver, either paper or physical, has been around 20% to 25%. Do you know if that participation rate of 2% includes paper? It does. So include and and we know, obviously March really <laughs> let everyone know what we've known in this industry for a long time is that there's way too much paper promises for the physical product. So that two percent is inclusive of paper products or paper investments in mm -hmm. gold versus gold ownership. So that's very interesting. So okay, so we've got that. We know participation rate is nowhere near the high. I also think it's interesting because from my perspective, they're still very much undervalued, but the type of interest in the market, you would think that the price of silver was already trading at all time highs in fifty dollar range, but that's not that's not the case. Um, so are we are we overvalued yet on gold and silver? We are certainly not overvalued on gold and silver. I think that sometimes mentally there's a, a wall or barrier. And when we see gold and silver rise as fast as we have over the short term, it is easy to think that both metals will certainly have their uh, period of pullback. But certainly those typically coincide with certain periods of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. We've now exited the sell point of the year, which is traditionally over the last, let's say, 50, 60 years, has been the springtime where we see most of the profit taking occur. And we're now entering into the part of the cycle where we've gotten our best buy opportunities, June, July, which is, again, historically right on point with what we've expected to see. And uh, now they're pushing forward now here into the new cycle that will take us at least through towards the next spring, if not the next few years. So that's interesting, bringing into a perspective of sort of the the typical trades that you see throughout the season and when you would see the buying, when you would see the selling. I think on the other hand, um, you know, there was a great interview this week with uh, Peter Schiff and Jim Rickards on, on Kitco News. Yeah, they didn't say anything that we didn't really already know, but it was nice to see the two, the two uh, analysts come together and they supported the idea that really the low in the market was when gold hit 1080 an ounce. And that was really the low several years ago and we've been working our way up since then. 
I think everyone in this industry is surprised at how long it's taken for the market to make that actual breakout, which is more in line with what's been happening economically um, with the Fed as well. And we're going to get into some more of those details about what's happening in that side of things. So the general consensus out there to me, Darren, seems that, yeah, there, of course, nothing is going to go up in a straight line. There will be pullbacks. Just don't be too greedy on those pullbacks. Don't wait for something extreme because that most likely these pullbacks are going to be shallow if we do see them. Um, like we saw in, in this week in silver, we saw, I don't know, 80 cent pullback in, in the market. That seemed to be about all it would take. Uh, but on the other hand, we're seeing a lot of analysts talking about the market going up to 2500 by year's end. What do you think? Is that a possibility? Well, in the next segment, we'll talk about Jim Willie, who's uh, made some estimates based on his data and charting and information that he knows about the marketplace and saying exactly that, that the next stop for gold is 2500 silver, $50 an ounce. And ultimately, these prices are still relatively low compared to what a lot of the projections are, and we'll get into what they are and how to know that they're correct here on The Real Money Show, the number one eight seven seven eight silver the website guildhallwealth.com. And if you'd like to buy physical precious metals, you can just go on to guildhallpreciousmetals.com, our e-store, and you can uh, pick out some products there and take delivery or schedule a pickup. And what you'll notice on the site there is that if we don't have it available, we take the product down off the site. So you're not going to see products up there with delivery times of a month or two months from now. If it's up on the site, it's available for delivery. Darren, in the last segment, we were just discussing if it's too late for people to get involved in the market, having seen some great gains recently and uh, really gains that we've been waiting for for quite some time. And we just started on the back end of that segment to discuss where the potential of the market is for this year. What kind of numbers have you been reading or you th you projecting for the end of this year on gold and silver? Well, it's interesting because this is the first time in a long time where, as we're taping this show on Friday, silver has now exceeded the yearly gain of gold. And as we have talked about many a time before in talking about the fundamentals of the market and how these markets develop, gold usually leads the way which it's done last year it led the way 20 percent gain almost to silver's 15 percent gain and over the last six seven years as we've watched this market develop the base in gold has been stronger we've been waiting for silver to catch up well it looks yeah. like that time is coming now and if you look again a year to date gold's up about 29 percent to silver's 34 percent uh, well, gold trades now around 1970 and uh, silver at 24, just over 2410. It had both metals had their their largest monthly gains in a long period of time. Gold this month uh, has its best monthly gain to date since 2012, whereas silver this is its largest monthly gain in one month since 1982. And uh, if people look back to where we were in March with silver, silver's up 113% since March. We, we always said that silver was, was gold on steroids, that it would play major catch-up. This also, over the last month, is not taking into consideration the head fake that we saw back in March when silver was pushed down to below $12 an ounce. And... Um, I can't even remember what they pushed gold down to. Where where were we at in gold? It was like 1400, 1300 or something? Yeah, in the 1400 range. I just remember what's really interesting about that is people were very confused. They said, oh, this COVID thing's happening. Why is gold going down? This is ridiculous. Well, I think we can look at it now and realize, well, that was a paper push to try to get people to not be interested in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that what it what it caused instead was a rush into the market and people wanted toilet paper and physical gold and then the market turned around and rocketed much much higher so you have gold you have silver not just going from $18 where we were back in March up to 24 today it's actually gone from $11 and 50 cents ish up to $24 plus what was the what is that gain well, that is like 113%. Yeah, it's yeah massive. that's, that's it's massive. Yeah, of course. And if you uh, just look at the, the history of gold and silver and the way they've, the way they've performed, uh, if you look back to 2008, the same thing occurred. We had 
the fall of 2008 bring about a huge need for all of the printing and we had essentially the beginning of a recession really develop from that point forward and as it developed over the next 36 months prior to any uh, you know real growth in the marketplace money printing was the soup du jour and during that period of time silver went from eight dollars and fifty cents to fifty dollars by 2011 gold went from 650 all the way to 1930 dollars and that's exactly the same expectation that most decent analysts and, and people in this marketplace who know this market expect the, that gold and silver will take this time around uh, the same way the same path now we've always said that we'll have more buyers at higher prices because that's been our experience over the last 15 years and our experience in the last two weeks <laughs> yeah so but here's a question do you think that there's going to be even more buyers at silver when it's trading at 50 or gold trading at you know 2500 us an ounce than we're seeing right now in other words do you think there's still people that are not quite aware of the benefits of gold and silver as a way to protect capital well take a look at the relationship between the stock markets and gold and silver okay. typically one would move in the opposite direction of the other and yep. you'd have this big monumental gain as we did from 08 to 11 in gold and silver with a contraction in let's say the TSX and the Dow the uh, Nasdaq so forth but again right now what you're seeing is that central banks around the world and this is reason number one why I'm so bullish on gold and silver uh, central banks around the world are 100% committed to printing yeah and they cannot turn back time they have to forward they have to move forward with this concept in place and it's not going to end anytime soon and the stock markets have certainly done well in comparison to what we expected would happen but when that spigot gets turned off you're going to be in the middle of a very heated bull market in precious metals already now you've got limited participation with the rates in gold and silver already moving much higher and than very little product available very little product available you've got the threat of real inflation rates coming on the horizon and the end of money printing and in fact as we're taping this show they just announced that uh, Trudeau came out and said the end date is near for CERB so mm -hmm. they're going to convert to EI and uh, again now we know that 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 cliff of the mortgage deferrals the CERB payments the all the support mechanisms in place to help folks through COVID and all the stress of losing jobs and whatnot it's coming to an end and as it does it will happen around the whole world and what we'll see is we'll we'll see a shift in mentality to safety what is safe well if the currency is devaluating and the US dollar is it had its largest single monthly drop in uh, as long as I can remember down a full 5% across the board against all the other major currencies. And if that continues to happen, you know, expect gold and silver prices to be two, three times what they are now in a very short period of time. And that's the kind of momentum we can get. And as we go to break, Jeremy, our clients should remember silver and gold do not wait for anyone. They're not going to wait for you to sell your house or for you to be ready next year or to think about this over the next six, seven months. They're ready now. And they're moving now. And when you wake up, silver, it's at $24. I'm sure some listeners that were listening to this show today may be tuned in the last time when silver was trading at $19. That, what the heck just happened? Yeah, it, it is capital preservation. It is still better to be a month early than a day late. We have momentum on our side, which is a great thing. Seeing is believing. So um, understand that we still personally believe that the market is incredibly undervalued overall, especially when you start to look at the debts out there. We've got a lot more to talk about. Darren, we were just talking about money printing. And, and I mentioned at the top of the show, listening to this interview with Peter Schiff and, um, and uh, Jim Rickards, and one thing that Schiff brought up, which I thought was very interesting in lieu of what you were just discussing about money printing, is he was suggesting that one of the reasons why gold came down in the first place in 2011 and 13 after it had peaked was that there was this assumption out there in the markets that the Fed could normalize, that the Fed could take its balance sheet back down from, from $4 trillion back down to below $1 trillion. 
and that they could eventually normalize rates and get them back up to to regular levels, you know, let's say Greenspan levels or Bernanke levels, let's say 7%. And that never materialized. And in 2018, when they tried to start to raise interest rates, it really failed miserably. And then you saw in 2019, they started to lower rates again, and the markets were happy. And that's when gold really started to perk up again as well. So this time is different, though, isn't it? it we're, we don't have that expectation that we had in 2010, 11, 12, that the Fed is actually going to normalize. We don't. Central banks uh, around the world, they've gone on this COVID-19 spending and borrowing spree uh, to support growth. And I mean, that's created a lot of risks in the economy. It's going to cause serious problems going forward. It's going to create larger divides. There's going to be a greater division of wealth. And a lot of that wealth is going to be based on uh, those that have and those that don't have are going to be in a position that they've never felt before. And those that do have the wealth are going to, mark my words, have hard assets. They are going to own tangible things, part of which will be gold and silver. And I don't think that we can really get a great appreciation for how wide that's going to become until those spigots start to get turned off, until we realize how detrimental this has become to the individual investor and how bad it's getting. Yeah, I I actually not sure if the spigots are going to be turned off on central banks, Darren. I think that they're going to just keep printing money till the wheels come off. In the meantime, people are really waking up to it. Like we said, you know, if Peter Schiff was talking about the market believed the Fed could pay it down and and re get back to normal back in 2011. I don't think people are buying it this time. I think they realize that the the central banks are all in on this money printing, and they've really just not only thrown in the kitchen sink, they're just completely all in on it to see where where it goes next because they don't have any other options. There is no other move, and so when people go to the grocery store and they see prices are rising and they see gas prices are rising and they see insurance prices are rising or there was an article out last week talking about credit cards companies who are lowering the amount available to to customers basically cutting the cards up for the customers this is really putting people out and when you talk about the the gap between the rich and the poor i think people are they can physically see it now whereas before when we talked about it it was something uh, more theoretical it wasn't something that was actually happening we said it was going to happen now it's happening now people really believe it and in the face of all that Darren you know getting back to this idea of is it too late there's not enough physical supply there's such a big shortage in the market for physical supply that how can the price of silver and gold not go higher from here well, we talked about wealth disparities. We talked about loss of confidence. Currency depreciation is another big one because what's being felt here in Canada and the U.S., uh, we're certainly not the only ones feeling it. It's being you know, felt around the world by every major currency. Now, you know, if you throw into that mix the idea that there is a problem with supply and will continue to be a problem with supply for many reasons, not just because there's no gold or silver out there ever to mine, in order to get it to product, to get it to market, you have to go through a number of steps to fabricate it and have it pulled out of the mine. And where there is a lack of people power, that results in lower amounts of supply. That's not going to end anytime soon. We're going to see that be prolonged over a long period of time. And the demand is such right now, Jeremy, that at the very first phase of this big turnaround in pricing, we're already experiencing tremendous amounts of difficulty around the world trying to land big, big, huge hunks of gold and silver. That's going to get worse. And as it does, it only adds to the pressure of mounting that, that states, hey, listen, at some point we have to get the price high enough to encourage people to sell. Right. That's part of the big myth, right? Whenever someone has brought up uh, the issue of sound money, potentially uh, a gold standard of some kind, the knee-jerk re reaction is, there's not enough gold. Well, there is enough gold at the right price, and that's what the markets are supposed to do, a price, me uh, price discovery mechanism. But when there's been all that paper product out there and the physical price of metal was masked of what it would actually, how much was actually available, it was easy to 
to, to show a price that wasn't reflecting its true value. Hence, gold and silver were undervalued. Hence, it was you were able to buy way more silver than you really should have been able to buy. So for those who have been able to get in, even at these prices, you're still able to buy so much more silver than you should be able to get in the market. And at the end of the day, the prices will have to go much, much higher before A, people start start dishoarding it, they start letting go of it and selling it at higher prices, and it gives the markets a chance to catch up on the physical supply. So for those reasons, just talking about physical uh, and getting a hold of physical, I think that there's a great case there for much, much higher prices. In fact, we'll bring Paul in in the next segment, Paul Wiseman, president of Guildhall, to talk about supply, to give you a better sense of why this market could be headed much, much higher. Joining us now is Paul Wiseman, president of Guildhall. Paul, as you know, we've been talking about, you know, is it too late to get involved in the markets? We've seen some great rises in the market as of as of late, but uh, you have some information regarding the supply, which definitely flies in the face of, no, it's not too late. It's far from late. No, this is the beginning of a really strong, strong bull run. There is absolutely no product out there. Um, just to try to find one ounce gold bars, almost impossible. To find 100 ounce Royal Canadian Mint bars, almost impossible. Um, we've, you know, been sourcing some 100 ounce Asahi bars, which are going to be in next week. LBMA. Uh, LBMA approved. Uh, the same thing with kilo bars. Our kilo bars were nearly down to zip. I've able, again, been able to source Asahi kilo bars, which are really popular. Um, Ten ounce RCM bars. We are, you know, we probably were the only people that had them in stock, and those are almost gone too. Um, so, the product is getting rarer and rarer, uh, harder to find. This means there's going to be some short squeezes, and the product is going to probably fly to the moon. Now, how much do you think of the supply shortages right now, Paul, are a product of the fact that back in March when, when people decided that they wanted to take delivery of their physical, how much of it is people realizing that they didn't actually own any physical and now they're going out and getting that physical? Or is it more just you know, new demand coming into the market? There's obviously new new people. Headlines is going to push this pro product up. Uh, we have, you know, at Guildhall, it's always been the same way. We sold more silver. When silver was $5, we sold more at $10 than we did at 5 When it went to 25 we sold more at 25 than we did at 10 When it went to $49, we sold more at $49 than we sold at 25 Right. It feels like $40 now, yeah, though. Yeah, but it's a herd mentality. People jump on. You're seeing headlines now, gold reaches $2,000. People come out the woodwork. They've been sitting on the fence so long, all of a sudden they see a headline, it makes them buy. They don't follow the information. Mm -hmm. um, the information we provide people to let them know what's happening in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't take any notice till it goes up. You know, it's absolutely crazy. We can't get product. We have product but you can't find it. You can't source it. It's just but basically getting harder and harder. We're all fighting for the same product. And the only reason that we get our product is because we pay our bills. Well, so, we, we said, we indicated that there is going to be a, uh, a change in the dynamics of sort between the, the buys and the sells. Right now, we're averaging somewhere around maybe, um, I hesitate to guess, but I know it's fairly accurate, around 150 buys to one sell. And that'll increase as price increases. I mean, you'll have more sellers come to the fold. You have more people bring that product back in, and they'll want to sell at those higher prices and take their profit. I mean, that's only natural. But until that happens, gentlemen, the price goes higher from here. Mark my words. Even if there is a window in which on Tuesday the price went in silver, let's say, to 26 overnight, pulled back to the 23 range by, th by Thursday, and now in here Friday in the low 24 range, it's on its way back to that price. It's just a new area that was tested and tapped, and I expect both gold and silver, you know, over the next course of a week or two, 
they'll be higher than they've ever been. We'll go over 2000 an ounce in but, gold. But what difference does it make if silver drops down to $22 or $20 well, I hope it does, or like $19? To buy some, right? It's a it's a buying opportunity. Absolutely. Every time what they're doing is building a new bottom. So every time that bottom gets higher and higher, um, somebody is taking profit on paper. You know, at Guildhall, we don't sell paper. We don't do ETFs. We don't do certificates. We don't do options, futures and options. We sell the physical product. And if you can't find physical product, obviously the prices are going to go up. One of our customers placed an order the other day uh, for some gold maples. They went to one of the major banks and they were $100 more than what we were charging. And we had it. And we had it and they didn't. So, again, we're very careful about sourcing. You know, we have three inventories. One going out, one on the floor, and one replacing the one that's gone out. So that's why we're always prepared. Whether, you know, the price goes up or goes down, we have product. If we don't have product, we don't put it up on the website, we take it down. What's the point of showing product that you don't have and doing the bait and switch? Yeah, actually, I had a, a customer this week saying the same thing. He called a bit in a panic saying, there's products disappearing off your site. And I said, yeah, the reason for that is because we're if we're running out of it, we don't keep it up on the site if it's if we don't have it in stock. And we're certainly not going to put it up on the site and say delivery in in 15 days plus Three if it's on the site it's it's got to be deliverable and I actually had another customer contact us saying that they placed an order with a company back in March and they just received delivery this week which is absolutely crazy I mean th that is beyond conscionable for for us so we just don't do it so if you see it on the site it's available if it's not on the site, we don't have it. One of the reasons as well that they're shipping after three months is that if someone comes back and sells them product, now they've got product to sell. And this is, you know, a lot of companies work out there, um, you know, they work on a shoestring. They don't have the funds to carry them, to buy the product. As I said, we have three inventories, one going out, one on the floor, and one coming in to replace what we've sold. Every time we sell something, we replace it. We know the market is going to get busy. You know, we've been sitting here for eight years waiting for something to happen. Now, gold between 1999 and 2011 was up 700%. From 71 to 80, it was up 2,200%. Let's talk about what that would look like in today's market in the next segment. And uh, before we get into where the prices could go, because there's some great projections out there from some major analysts, I will say that uh, we constantly, Darren, get the same question, which is what would happen if the government decided to take my physical product? And I always find that a very interesting question. Logical, perhaps. Rational, perhaps not. Um, I always like to point out that the government has been confiscating your wealth through inflation for decades if they say inflation's at two percent and it's actually at five then every 10 years you're losing 50 percent of your purchasing power which means if you made a hundred thousand dollars ten years ago you need to be making a hundred and fifty thousand dollars today just to be keeping up with inflation and that's if you believe inflation is only running at five percent now if you've been to the grocery store lately you would probably disagree with that number and say it's probably much, much higher. So I find it interesting that people are willing to put up with wealth confiscation through inflation, through taxation, but when it comes to a small portion of their portfolio, they really hold up the sign and go, this is something I'm very concerned about. What do you say to people with that? Well, again, I think that it's blown out of proportion. I think people have to understand that there was give and take for every ounce that was taken in the U.S. Uh, out of, let's say, savings or deposit boxes or that was just offered up by people. There was an equal dollar value at the time given back. That happened to be $35 to, to every one ounce that was taken. Um, ultimately, it's never happened in Canada. There are more pressing 
uh, matters that we face and challenges that we look towards. And if there were, in fact, this is the exact opposite argument, and this is the reason why you should own gold and silver, because if there were going to be confiscation, it's going to come from your savings, it's going to come from your pension funds, it's going to come from money that is readily available and sitting there right now as we speak that's not touching anybody's you know, uh, um, retirement yet. They're not using it. It's not in accounts that are being used with an interact card or checking accounts. This is money that's just sitting on the sidelines. And, that's where they're going to go first. And you were just mentioning in, uh, during the break, Darren, you were saying that there's kind of issues now with the major banks in Canada. Well, three of the major banks anyways, TD, Scotiabank, and RBC have announced uh, roughly just over 100,000 employees stay home until next year at some point. So TD said... Uh, this week, 89,000 workers are, are are going to be staying home. So if you are looking to your branches being, um, you know, well-staffed and ready for you when, you know, things get back to a slightly more normal pace, uh, and that's happening, uh, good luck because the lineups are still going to be there. I know my own bank uh, has requested that if I'm doing anything else other than a deposit or withdrawal, that I call ahead of time to make an appointment. I open up a couple of accounts the other day for, for the kids, and I had to make an appointment to come in and see an advisor, a planner, because the, the upload was on, you know, the upsale was on. It wasn't I could go see a teller and get the same thing done. Had to see a planner because they wanted to ask, where's your money? What's it doing right now? And, you know, maybe we have some options for you. So they're using all the techniques they can to try and drive business. But the reality is at the corporate level, all of our banks around Canada have now given that, uh, along with a lot of corporate Canada, mm -hmm. that option to their employees to stay home. So again, a difficult situation to be in, whether you're on either side of the fence with COVID-19, to get back to work and let's get things going back and observe some simple rules, or whether you believe this is a full-blown pandemic that's going to continue. Um, that's not what we're here to talk about. It just means the future is different than what we had perceived would be the case. Mm -hmm. And because of that, Central banks have to continue to turn on that spigot and let that money flow freely and support in a very socialist manner uh, their constituents. And that's going to happen here. And that's another reason why you need insurance policy like gold or silver. One eight seven seven eight silver is the number. Guildhallwealth.com is the website. Yeah, Darren, and you know, looking back at 1933 when, when you know, people handed in their gold it wasn't taken from them and they got cash back there's a reason why they were why the the citizenry put up with it there was a gold standard people were patriotic it was twenty dollar twenty dollar gold it was twenty dollar gold and they re 25 yeah to, and they put it back up at 35. yeah but there but remember there was a, a faith in government there was a faith in central banking there was a faith in worked. the currency because it was backed by gold and so you had you had patriotism there is no way anyone's going to put up with it. And so what I end up saying to those people who ask the question, because I don't mind getting the question, is I say you put up with wealth confiscation through inflation. You, you, put it up, you put up with it through taxation. But when it comes to them physically, you're talking about fascism, physically, tanks rolling in the streets, gun in your face, take my gold. No, we're not gonna we're not gonna nationalize a mine where we could just take out millions of ounces really quick. We want your gold, right? That that represents, as you said at the top of the show, Darren, less than two percent of the population. When are you going to stand up? When are you going to get a pitchfork and say, I'm done with this government, I'm no longer gonna be intimidated? One of the interesting things, there was an article this week that I read about Great Britain. Mm -hmm. They've um they discontinued some bills, some of their currency. So there's billions and billions of pound notes, yeah. five, ten, twenty pound notes sitting under mattresses, buried, God knows what else it is. If it was gold, it's still got its value. Right. Old bank notes. They gotta get it to the get, bank. They gotta get it to the bank and they're giving you maybe another couple of months before they say you've done. Right. You know, they've confiscated, they've done that with the the one pound coin. There's none available. In the States right now, they've got a problem. No one's got any coins. No, no, no. They're saying they don't have coins. Well, We've seen the playbook before. They did it in the 60s. They said, oh, we don't have enough silver for the coins. We're taking it out. You know, this is a good way to get people onto a cashless thing and put that money, as you're talking about, Darren, with the banks, to have the, the that money in the bank as opposed to outside of the bank. But at the same time, you know, about confiscating gold, 
if they're confiscating currencies by discontinuing, say, okay, fine, we're now going to print a different type of note, right. and the note that you've got is no good anymore, how much money is sleeping that's never going to come to light again? And again, it's confiscation. Welcome back to The Real Money Show, the website guildhallwealth.com, the phone number one eight seven seven eight silver And remember, if you can't hold it, you don't own it. We only deal in physical precious metals here at Guildhall. Paul, you were just about to say something during yeah, the break. I, I had a customer yesterday who bought some, some gold. He had fifteen, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 with a mutual fund or whatever. On his $14,000, he made 60 cents. That's what the profit was. Whatever they put him in, in that mutual fund, the time they took their fees, he made 60 cents on $14,000. So he said, I might as well just buy gold. What's the return on gold over the last 15 years? An average is 11% a year. Canadian. I rest my case. Yeah. I, I know. I, I have the same thing a lot of times. People still have a concern, obviously, about physically storing precious metals and paying for the storage on that, which is essentially 1%. And you say, okay, well, you could get 1% at the bank and lose to inflation. You could pay 1% on an asset that's getting 11% a year, and you're doing quite well. So you have to keep these things into perspective. Um, Darren, on the gold price gains. Jim Rickards, as I mentioned, we were talking about that interview, says that it could easily go to 15,000 by 2025. What do you think about uh, a number like that? I think it's astronomical to begin with, and it's hard for people to mentally get their head around that. It's no different than a person that was buying silver, let's say, at $4, and you tell them it's going to 50. Right, and they think to yourself, "Well, that'd be great if it did, but I don't expect it to." I mean, four to turn turn to eight would be great, you know. Right. And then it goes to eight, and you tell them it's going to twenty, and they say, "Well, I don't know about that." And it goes to twenty, and they say, "Well, it's awesome, it's incredible." And you tell them it's going to fifty. Well, it's the same thing now with gold. Two thousand is no longer a barrier. We're almost there. We didn't think, and many people didn't believe that gold would get back to its all-time high that it had already reached in two thousand eleven, but it's there. Yeah, and so, went through it like a knife through, like a hot knife through butter. Of course it did, and that's exactly what we call that momentum shift, right? And that's going to continue on for a few more weeks, and then again it's going to start to function on its set of fundamentals as it does, and it'll be a slow, long climb, and we hope that it is because it allows people to establish bigger positions. It allows them to use cash they're getting from other resources and put it into there. It also allows people time to plan and get ready for this. But um, gone are the days where I can accept uh, that any individual who's managing money or in the bank system and talks about gold as being cumbersome or outdated or a relic or something of the past or of no value or too volatile, it's BS. And I'll tell them to their face. I mean, they should challenge to be better, challenge themselves to know more about what diversification really should include. And then they'd realize that when you can manage logistics, buying, selling by phone, storage, it's easily you can go have visitation, have it in your registered accounts. All of these things are what has what Guildhall has built themselves around. And that's why in this day and age, there's no excuse for not having gold and silver. In fact, it could be a much larger part of a person's portfolio, and I personally have no problem with it. I'm not your financial planner, though. So you have to get your head around it. But Guildhall is here and will be that whole time. And so I expect that gold and silver are going to be wonderful assets. And, yeah, those prices could definitely come to a reality. Gerald Salenti always says, gold is for your golden years. Um, I'm a great believer in that. Um, I give my grandkids on it, on their birthday an ounce of gold. Uh, my oldest granddaughter is 14. She's done extremely well. You know, at one time gold was trading at $500 an ounce. Today it's $2,000 an ounce. If I were to give her the same $500 and just put it into a savings account, uh, she would have got more interest at Max Milk than she would have got, you know, at the bank. So it was great when interest rates were 10 percent, 12 percent. If you had a hundred thousand or a million dollars, you could live on in your retirement by just on the interest. You need to have a hard asset in your portfolio. Gold and silver, as you said, gold's up an average of the last 15 years about 11 percent. 
a what, year. A year. What a better what a better investment. I want to make something very clear too, guys. We have a milestone reach this week. We started doing registered counts, uh, being able to put gold and silver in self-directed RSPs and TFSAs where the client gets the choice to buy or sell and manage their account with our expertise in gold and silver. And this week, we started hitting the 100% return mark. So that's a milestone. We have wow. our first accounts hitting over 100% return. Uh, I started looking at them, and um, that is a absolute reality. We and are sitting on a bunch of accounts now that have made an average of 25% a year or more. Wow, that's amazing. Well, I think we started five, no, it was it 2016 we started, right? Yeah, so it's just shy of five was, years. We just touched at the end of 2015, and then now 2016 was our first full permanent year of doing it. So, yeah, wow. no, it's been amazing. I actually have a client I was just speaking to. I think he's been in the market for less than a year, and he's up 40%. 45%, um, you know, various products in the market. And uh, so we know people are very, very happy. We want to continue to help people, new clients come into the market because we, as we've talked about on the show, we think that there's a great potential for the market to be headed much, much higher. Given the fact, this is the takeaway. If you've listened to nothing for this show, listen to this. How can the market see significant dips from here if there's no product available? That is that would be completely opposite of how supply and demand works. Until there is a massive supply availability, you are not going to see major dips in this market. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about, well, I won't buy gold until it drops back down to 1800 or I won't buy silver until it drops back down to $19 an ounce. If there's no physical available, there really is only one place for it to go. It's better to be one month too early than one day too late. The people that are too late never get back into the market. It's like taking money out of your savings account. Yeah, you lose you, money you, just waiting. No, no. Ne people never put money back into their savings account when they've taken it out. It's very hard to do. So it's again, it's better to be here um, a month, two months too early than one day too late. Get into the market, buy some gold, buy some silver. It's your insurance policy to insure your wealth.